Hi, uh, I'm Herman Bilnitzer. I was born October 31st, 1920. I will be 99 years old this month. My mother was of German descent. My father was a full-blooded Hungarian from the old country, the old Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And uh, I attended early school in Raga, Michigan. From there, we moved to Jordan, Texas, which is somewhat below San Antonio, uh, kind of wild country at that time. Uh, uh, that was a rough section of Texas at one time. And uh, my early childhood started off in the elementary school of Raga, Michigan, before we came to Texas. I was, uh, let's see, I, uh, stop it for just a minute. To, let me get some of my thoughts together. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Jordan, Texas. I was number six in the family of ten. And I graduated from Jordan High School. But in my early days, as a young boy, uh, we had to do a lot of cow milking, at, both at home, and I was hired out to do milking, and picking cotton in a hot Texas sun and uh, do it for half a penny a pound. And that, those were hot, horrible days picking cotton in South Texas. And uh, some of the people we worked for were real good. They fed us breakfast and brought us even a noon lunch meal out in the hot sunshine of South Texas. But we had to keep picking cotton until sundown. And it went from sundown from sunup to sundown. And uh, I did not like picking in that hot, hot weather. Uh, I uh, enjoyed riding horseback and riding up for cows in my younger days when I was 12, 13 years old as a teenager. I was pretty good on a horse back then. And in high school, I played football in junior high and high school, and I loved it. In fact, I loved it so much that I, in my college years, I took the courses necessary to become a coach and a science teacher. And so from there, from the cotton patches in Jordan and Texas, I went to, uh, let's see, Cotton Patch and I attended Texas Lutheran a Junior College to get my uh, uh, minor degree there. And then I took my master's degree from North Texas State University, which is a very good school. Uh, I stayed in Kerrville for a time of 36 years. My, I met a very wonderful, sweet nurse. She was a V-12 uh, trained nurse, and she helped to take care of some of the uh, people that were seriously injured at Pearl Harbor. Uh, I took my training with the Marine Corps. I s signed up for the Navy because I was 21 years of age when the war came along. I was teaching school at the time, and they gave me just enough time to finish out the school year, and I would have been drafted, but I volunteered to join the Navy. I wanted to see the world, and I thought being aboard a big battleship or aircraft carrier would be great. So I took the boot camp training uh, in the Navy, and then I was transferred to a hospital to uh, <clears throat> to where I took some medical training because I'd had some training in college in biology and first aid and so forth. Well, no sooner did I get through with that medical training in the hospital t to know what to do in a way of administrating some first aid, uh, I was uh, 
I was sent to, instead of staying in the Navy, as a corpsman in the Navy, they shipped me into the Marine Corps as a combat medic. And that was all hell. I was 20, 21 years of age when the war came along, and I stayed in there until the war was over, plus a few extra months at Nagasaki. Uh, my time in combat with the Marines, I got to say this, the Marines were really a grand bunch of fellas, very patriotic. Uh, they knew what duty and honor was. And uh, I saw, I was in several combat situations in the Pacific. The first one being in Guadalcanal, which was uh, quite, quite, I should say, a hellish place to be. We were cut off from our supplies from the United States for a while. We had to live in practically captured jack, uh, rice that we captured from the Japs and fish heads. And the uh, uh, diet we had wasn't very good. We had to eat a lot of coconuts and bananas that we found on the island. But from 180 pounds, it went down to 150. And to make things more miserable on the island, the Japs never stopped bombing us at night. They'd come in at nighttime to harass us just to keep us awake. And then there was Tokyo Rose, who spent a lot of time on the radio broadcasting to us, telling us to surrender, give up. Uncle Sam didn't care anything about us. If we didn't give up, they would soon capture us and make us prisoners of war and eventually citizens of the rising sun, which is a bunch of poo-hoo. They even dropped uh, some of their money on us on the island saying you could use it when you come to Japan to live. Yeah, that was a lot of humbug. Uh, and I will say one of the worst naval battles of the war was fought on Guadalcanal around November the 13th. And uh, it was horrible. Our battleships and the Japanese battleships uh, fought it out in the Navy, in the naval waters there, right off the island of Guadalcanal. But the Japs kept pouring really heavy bombs or shells into the island, 16-inch shells. Some of them would hit the top of coconut trees and just break them down while we were in our foxholes in the ground. And every time some of their large shells would explode, you could just feel the earth shaking and some of the dry dirt above the foxhole there would kind of crumble and fall into the foxhole. But it rained. It rained and rained more and more in that island. And uh, like I say, for about, oh, three or four months there, we did not have hardly anything to eat. That's where we lost all this, our extra weight that we were supposed to have had on in order to keep us going. But when you drop from 185 pounds to 160, 150, you don't feel too good. And uh, so we, after uh, the fighting kind of slowed down on the Guadalcanal, army units came in there to relieve us. We went to Brisbane, Australia for rest, rehabilitation, and to be fattened up again for the next kill. And uh, I got to say this, when we approached the uh, Australia, right after we got off that island, we were on one of those troop transports, and as crowded as could be with guys that were hungry for everything. And before we got off <laughs> the ship there at Australia, some of those Aussie women came out a little to the water to give us a welcome. And they're out there in their shorts and their small boats, waving and uh, and making all kinds of signs out there. And the Marines aboard this troop transport were so eager to see him. We hadn't seen a woman, a white woman, in six months. Uh, everyone ran to the starboard side of the ship 
went and see those girls out there in those little boats, paddle boats. And my God, finally, so many got to one side of the ship, the starting board side, and the captain of the ship got out in the PA system and said, hey, fellas, some of you get back to the other side. We're going to capsize if you don't get, get her over to the other side. And just They were just all so eager to see those white girls for a change. Well, in Australia, they really treated us good because we actually saved, uh, in Guadalcanal, we saved Aust uh, Australia from being invaded by the Japs. No telling what would have happened if they had taken over Australia. But anyway, we didn't let them get down that far because uh, the other units, army units, were fighting them in some of the islands offshore uh, from Australia. Well, after being in Australia, which was a uh, heaven God sent for us, we were sent to, uh, we sent back to New Guinea to where we were pre being prepared to go into combat again and uh, a place, uh, it was, uh, the island the Cape Gloucester, Chester, and also, it was a place where the Japanese on this one island there uh, had fortified very, very well with about 50,000 troops. And they're making uh, airstrips there and everything else in order to uh, keep uh, the, us from going back into Australia and having to fight there or from taking over the some more islands. The Japs were very, very hard seasoned fighters by that time. They wanted to fight to the very finish, that's for sure. They just did not believe in giving up. They'd rather die than give up. Uh, the Japs were very, very fanatical fighters. Well, anyway, uh, we were stationed on an Island there, I've forgotten the name right off and it was very, very... New Britain. The part, New Britain. Yeah, New Britain. Uh, it was New Britain. They had a stronghold there. And uh, being in the 1st Marine Division, our job was to get New Britain and secure that island for us because they were building airstrips there. And that's where we saw some of the toughest fighters. Uh, they didn't want to give up New Britain. And that's where I saw what I call holy hell. Uh, we, as in the combat units with the Marines in a company called K Company. I guess, I don't know how many men were in there. A few hundred in K Company. And everything is divided into company and regiments and so forth. Well, anyway, on New Britain, excuse me, uh, we, hold it just a minute. On New Britain. Sir, if you uh, don't mind, if you just put your hands down a little lower, it's just, you're blocking your face. Uh, yeah. Then All right. put your hands down a little bit lower because it's yeah. blocking your face. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> on, uh, New Britain, we knew we had to stop them there. And uh, I happened to be in K Company, which was one of the lead companies in the 1st Marine Division. And we were in there fighting them. And uh, one place we called it Suicide Creek that we never did conquer because the Japs were on the other side. They were dug underneath some of those big old giant trees in the jungle. Some of the guys were up in the trees, snipers shooting down on us. And finally, we had a retreat. We had a pullback, because all we, we were just getting more and more men hit and killed. And uh, we pulled back, but we knew that we had not secured that island with that one battle. And what happened, uh, we were, Oh, what I say, reinforced again with to replace those that were injured, sick, and died. And we, uh, 
the worst thing is the, the Japs uh, fell back into a fortified place, made a real strong line there on top of a ridge looking down on us because they knew we were going after them. And uh, it was in the night time. Uh, we had prepared for this battle with the Japanese. It's going to be a battle to the finish, either us or them. And uh, we had moved everything into position the way we wanted so that we could move forward well armed, well fortified. Uh, we had with us a, a mortar platoon, we had the rifle group, we had the 105 howitzers behind us. Uh, we had the regular infantry men with the rifles. We were going to stop them. No way. Well, the Japs knew that uh, we had halted to a certain place there, and they were going to counterattack us, try to push us back. They had the high mound looking down on us, but we also had a 35-millimeter cannon that we could fire and blast things out in front of us through the thunk. Uh, thick uh, jungle. Well, anyway, uh, we knew they were going to attack us. And it was about, well, I'd say 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. We had what you call a 50% uh, alert. 50% of the guys would be in duty uh, while the other 50% rested just a little bit. We knew they were going to come and attack us that night, which meant we would be 100% alert that night. And in the Marine Corps, you had what you call a, a password if you got out of your foxhole at night or were moving in the jungle. It was called Filipino. And uh, we would keep that word Filipino as a word in moving through a heavily occupied place. Filipino, Filipino. If we were moving and crawling on our hands and knees sometimes, uh, you better be careful because your own men might fire on you. I remember very well uh, one night there uh, I was in the thick of battle. Uh, we uh, They had made an attack and boy we let them have it with everything you could imagine. With the mortars, with the machine guns cross-fired, uh, with uh, the artillery from the rear, uh, everything we had that we could throw at them, we threw at them on the front line. But they kept coming, and we just kept killing them off because they wouldn't stop there so fanatic. And anyway, uh, when I got close to, after the battle, the thick of the battle was over, sitting in, sitting in the extreme darkness in the jungle at night, uh, except for the gunfire, which looked all the gunfire, which looked like a huge Fourth of July celebration, uh, you couldn't see anything out there. You couldn't even see your hands in front of you. You could hear the guys uh, hollering, "Corman, Corman, Corman!" That was what I was, was up there for, to help take care of the wounded and those that were seriously wounded. And I remember crawling on my hands and knees going from one uh, foxhole to another, and saying, Filipino, Filipino. And one old guy told me the next one, he said, Doc, I had my gun right and you're uh, focused on your head. I was ready to pull the trigger until I heard you say, Filipino. Well, I don't know how many I had to take care of right at that particular time of the night. I had been wounded, hit, Anyway, when uh, the battle, what the Japanese were trying to do, is they were trying to break through the line right where our 37 millimeter cannon was, and that's where I was stationed. Uh, we were gonna protect that at all costs. They wanted to take that cannon out, go through the line, and spread out behind our line, and wipe us up from the backside. Well, we couldn't let that happen. So the guys were really uh, firing everything they had at them. Well, the first wave was bad enough, 
but then they attacked it three different times that night, each time with a new group coming forward. And how many Japs were killed that night, I don't know. You could walk across the bodies out there in front of the line from one to the other. And uh, it, it was just terrible, the killing that took place that night. And we had a lot of men wounded. And it wasn't until we started running really low, low not only on manpower, but low in ammunition. And I didn't know what in the heck is going to come up next. And finally, close to daybreak, another one of our, uh, another company from the 1st Marine Division, which was being held in reserve, moved up to the front line and took over our positions. And they relieved us. And when we got off the front line, we were so dead, tired, exhausted, they pulled us back let us go further back and rest. I think I must have slept 24 hours straight. But the battle was over with, that, the main battle. Could you tell me more about the men who you treated during that battle? The what? men I treated? Yeah. Well, the men that I treated, uh, they, they had gunshot wounds, yes. Yeah, some of them had other wounds. Some had their legs shot off and... Uh, some of them got right up to the foxholes and shot the guys, wounded them right in our own foxholes. And uh, they, I know one I tried to take care of, uh, he got shot real, real bad. I guess he got hit in the chest, but in the darkness of the night in the jungle, I couldn't stop the bleeding, and he died right there in my arms. And uh, it... All right, we got enough men injured that night, but when daylight came, or close to daylight, this other company relieved us. We went in there with about, I think it was 220 men, something like that, in our company, and we came out of there with about 90. And that was the worst battle I ever got in on those islands. And then, after that, they sent us back because uh, we were so shot up. We were just nothing but skin and bones and a bunch of neurotics and what have you. They sent us to a little island of Pavuvu, and there we stayed for a few months for rest and rehabilitation. And finally, they thought they knew that that division wouldn't fit for combat anymore and we got to come back home being relieved by another full division on the islands there. Um, uh, can you tell me about the conditions of Pavuvu when you first got there? Oh my God, in Pavuvu, that was just a place where we were waiting to be picked up and brought back to the United States. In Pavuvu, it rained every day, it seemed like, and uh, we were supposed to get in Good food, well, if you call bananas and coconuts good, after a certain length of time, they didn't taste so good. And if we did get any food, it was rationed in little cans at about half the size of a sardine can. And uh, that was, well, it wasn't, uh, but it wasn't sardines in there. We had just a little round can of rationed food. Uh, it looked more like chili. <laughs> we ate that stuff, and it, anything but tasty. And uh, we were supposed to get... It wasn't until we got off of that lousy island of Pavuvu, got back aboard ship, that uh, we finally got a square meal again. But uh, food is just a thing that was unheard of, is all, unless you wanted to eat uh, more coconuts and bananas, but uh, sometimes you didn't always find the bananas the way you wanted them. I know the order was we weren't supposed to eat too many bananas, supposed to leave them for the natives, some of those bananas. And uh, uh, that wasn't the nicest thing they could do, but there are plenty of coconuts to eat. 
And other than that, you were supposed to survive in the very fact that you had. Well, after being out in those islands a certain length of time, you didn't have much reserve fat anymore. You got down to skin and bones and you didn't feel quite right. I remember going back off the front line and I ran into a guy that had been with uh, before we shipped out and he took one look at me. Uh, he's in the back taking care of the wounded further back behind the lines. And I told him, hey, Arthur, how are you? And he took one look at me and he says, well, who in the hell are you? I said, don't you remember me? I said, no. we were almost bunkmates back in the States. And he said, no. He says, you look like something the cat's drug up. And I thought, that's a fine compliment. But uh, anyway, they took us off. And then as soon as possible, they send us back home to the United States. I got back to the United States, and we were walking home with the band playing and this and that in the docks of San Diego or San Francisco, whichever one it was. And they gave us, a, all, us all of us had been in combat so long, uh, it wasn't leave, but they put us on a naval base where they fed us pretty good. After you got a little bit of fat back on us and didn't look like something the cat struck out, we shipped out to the west coast again, and we were told uh, we you got uh, the Japanese. I think they dropped a bomb while we were in rehabilitation back in the States. They had surrendered unconditionally. And they, I had enough points at that time to get out. And they, uh, and I was again picked to go back overseas. And I, they sent us to Nagasaki. And we didn't get a very good reception to, we hit the island of Japan because we dropped that atomic bomb and they hated our guts. Uh, they'd, we'd see them down the street and they'd spit in front of us and look the other way, even though we tried to be halfway decent to them. And even the first night we were there on the island of Japan, they uh, tried, to bomb, tried to burn the barracks down we were in. And man, that was something else. Well, the Marines really got out in a hurry. And with everything imaginable, well, fought the flames on that thing until it was out. But the Japs hated our guts at first. If you weren't careful, you're walking around on the street somewhere, you dare not go by yourself, you might get your throat slit. And uh, the little kids, I felt so sorry for them. I tell you, the Japs took everything and used it and let the troops have the best of everything. The soldiers took it. And uh, the little kids were nothing but rags. And it was wintertime, cold. And uh, if you had a candy bar, you'd give it to them if you were walking outside of the compound. And uh, they liked to get cigarettes to give to their daddy or whoever was there because... That's one thing they did give us, was lots of cigarettes, thinking that was a pacifier some type. But I didn't care for the cigarettes, and I took mine and threw them in a bay. <laughs> anyway, uh, I was glad when the order came, because I did help bandage up some of those Japs that had terrible flash wounds on their arm from radiation. I. Uh, uh, helped bandage some of them up even after the war was over with. And uh, coming back to the United States was the best thing of all. And it didn't take long before I got my discharge paper that I'd really been looking for. <laughs> and that's about it. Th thank you for explaining that. Um, if it's okay, I just want to go over a couple of the stories in more detail. I, uh, I took some notes. You see, 
you, you did an interview about 20 years ago with the Pacific War Museum in Fredericksburg. Yeah. And so I've listened to that interview recently, and I've taken notes about oh. some things that we haven't covered. Yeah. If you... that's okay, I just want to ask you about a couple of the things. Sure. Okay. So um, before we do that, could you just state for the record, uh, when you were attached to the Marine Corps, what company, regiment, and division were you in? I was... <sighs> I would say I say Shanghai to the Marine Corps. They tell you, see the uh, if you're in the Marine Corps, you're also part of the Navy, and they can switch you back and forth wherever they want you. And since I was a medic, had some medical training, uh, they well they discharged me. That's I was ready to come home. I'd had enough. I was just... Yes, Daddy? Because he know, I know he knows it. It's just K-3-5. He was in K company. Okay. Dad, were you in K-3-5? Was that the name of your company, correct? K-3-5 is who you served with? You were with K company of the 5th Marines, 1st Division. Yeah. Could, all I needed, I just want you to say that if you don't mind. Yeah, I was... Uh, I wasn't detached from the Navy at all. I was still in the Navy, but I was stationed with the Marines. And he wants you to state your what exact division you were in, Daddy. What was I K3. in? K-35. Mm -hmm. K Company 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. Say that one more time. Say it one uh, more time. K Company 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. 1st Marine Division. And do you remember the company commander of K-3-5? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, I was written up for the Silver Star or Cross, but no, Silver Star. But I never got it because uh, the captain that wrote me up, <laughs> it's a funny thing. He even let us read the letter. That was a funny thing. And then it had to go back to the major for approval. And somehow or another, this major never liked us because we didn't care for him. Uh, we were in the Navy. He was in the Marine Corps. And uh, he said, no corpsman's going to be given a cross. That was just his uh, comment. And so we never got to cross. W were you put up for the Navy cross or the Silver Star? I was put up with a... Uh, cross, the uh, Navy, uh, no, 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 uh, Silver Star, that's what it was. What was the incident that you were put up for the Silver Star for? Where was I? What was the incident that you were going to get the Silver Star for? What was Oh, the... well, it was actually the kind of uh, taking care of those guys on the front line and uh, subjecting ourselves to enemy fire. I could have been bumped off just as easy as can be. Sure. I, oh man, I tell you, if I hadn't hugged the ground at times, the bullets would be flying overhead. But I had enough sense to stay in the ground till most of that firing was over with. If you stood up and thought you were a brave bravo, boy, that's a good way to get mowed down. Uh, and... Uh, before we get into that, uh, just to continue on the whole company thing, uh, the company commander was Captain Haldane. Oh, Captain Haldane was a great guy. He was a good football player. That's one reason why he was made a captain. I guess. But Captain Haldane in the next battle, it's on Peladu, I think it was, uh, he, he was leading the company like he always did, and he was trying to scout on the Japs where they were out front, and a sniper got him right in the head. Uh, he was one of the greatest guys I knew. What, what kind of person was he? From your interaction with him, what kind of leader and person was he? Pardon? What kind of leader was Captain Haldane? What is that question? Of what kind of a leader was Captain Haldane? Give a little bit of detail about 
what oh, he, he was. Captain Haldane was a type he wouldn't. Uh, uh, I tell you, he was just a gentleman. That's number one. He was a gentleman, and he uh, treated us corpsmen real good. I, I guess the reason uh, he treated us so good, I in those islands, they always had you go on patrols. And some of those guys just wouldn't go on a patrol. They were scared they were going to get killed. And I think I went with Captain Haldane on two patrols. And uh, we were going towards that huge naval base that the Japs had on the other end of Cape Gloucester there. Rabal. Rabal, yeah. We were going up that way. And... Uh, it was there that when the orders came that I and a few others were being relieved to go back to the base, to go home, because we were so shot up, I mean, just nothing but skin and bones. And guys would crack up. Oh, they'd, st they'd call them, oh, they'd sit underneath the tree and stare out into space and just numb. Uh, and those guys are no good in combat. On any of the patrols that you went on, on Guadalajara? Two. Two patrols. Mm -hmm. And that was enough. That one patrol, we got lost one night. Uh, we, were, we got on a jungle trail and we got lost. And uh, that was horrible. We finally occupied some former Japanese holes. And... Uh, the mosquitoes were so thick and heavy in those old mud-filled holes, and then we used what we call scat, uh, some kind of medication you put in your neck and arms to keep the mosquitoes down. That didn't work. I mean, I got stung so much that night and didn't sleep either in the foxhole. There's that mud down in the foxhole. Uh, that... Uh, the next morning, or when daylight came, I could hardly see. My eyes were almost swollen, completely shut. Uh, they just squint to see a little bit. And that's when we had to find our way back to the company again, because we were out on patrol. And I tell you one thing on that, patrolling is not fun. Uh, you have a squad of men, or half of a platoon, and uh, you don't know what you're going to run into. Well, in trying to find a new trail or something, whatever it was that they were looking for, we were going through the jungle there, single file, and the old signal was, uh, if it went like that, that man, hurry up. If it went like that, that man, hit the ground. You follow the lead man. And, uh, Anyway, once I remember one time uh, we had uh, we were going along single file about four or five yards apart, one behind the other, and uh, suddenly we heard some jabbering over to one side, and we wouldn't know what, who was over there with us natives or who it was. They said, hey, we Marines, and then thrrr, they opened up with fire. Uh, it was lousy Japs, and uh, we had a guy with us, I'll never forget this. He'd been hit on Guadalcanal once, and he just went complete nuts, batty. He was supposed to get down on the ground and shut up. He wouldn't do it. And finally, the other corpsman that I was with, we worked in Paris, he was a little boxer at one night. He just hauled off and knocked him out, knocked him cold. And then we gave him some morphine, and that settled him down. Uh, that's just the way it was in those patrols. You never knew what you were going to run into. That was on one of your patrols. What happened on, what happened on the other patrol? On the other patrol... Oh, that's a, I got to tell you this, that's going towards Rabal. Uh, 
And we were supposed to find out if, from, if we could capture any of their scouts or troops, we need to get some information about what's down at Rabal. Because word had to had about 50,000 troops down there. And so they sent us on this patrol with a few Higgins boats. And we kept going along. And, uh, and we had a canine dog with us, too. That old dog, he was pretty sharp. Those dogs were really good at sniffing out the Japs. And uh, I remember on this one occasion, we stopped and uh, trying to get some information from the lead, leaders in the patrol. And they brought two Japs back to the captain there. Nothing but skin and bones, those guys. You could have stuffed all of them down one of my trousers legs. Nothing but skin and bone. And they had nothing but uh, screw worms in them, something like screw worms that eaten into their flesh and hands. And I'll never forget this. Uh, the old captain, Captain Haldane, said, uh, uh, hey, you corpsmen, patch him up a little bit. Well, what we did, we got our alcohol swabs out or whatever kind of swab it was, tried to get rid of those worms that were in the arms, and uh, said, now, you got a little something to eat? Yeah, what do you got left in your pack? Well, give them some food, too, what you got left. That canned ration. And I remember when I took my medical kit and opened it up, got the scissors out and a white bandage, tried to wrap some of those bandages around his fingers and arms. That poor guy, he thought I was going to kill him at first when I opened that kit. But when he saw I was going to bandage him up, he just cried. And uh, they sent him back for our intelligence to debrief what was on that island further ahead, Tallahassee. Uh, Tallahassee, and we found out, yeah, the Japs were building more airstrips down there. They had a lot of men that were even down there after the war ended. And they had so many down there in that island. and. Uh, Oh, it was a submarine base also. It was a submarine base, a fleet base, and a, a troop base. But we had cut off air supplies as much as possible with our own submarines. And uh, they were having a rough time now, but what they'd do, they'd steal everything from the natives. The coconut, the bananas, or any kind of wild animal they could get. And of course, they loved fish, some of them knew how to fish. And at the end of the war, so the saying goes, I wasn't there then, there's still quite a few of those Japs over there at Rabal. They managed to survive. They took what they could from the Navy, stole it from them. Yeah, okay. Thank you for explaining that. Um, before we go uh, any further, could you just backtrack um, do you remember when you first arrived on Guadalcanal? Were you with the initial... Oh, yeah. I was with the first wave of reinforcements there. And we pulled us up to the shore. And my God, the, the island was anything but secure. No sooner had we gotten off the ship. See, when you get, uh, come to shore like that, you're going to have... Uh, you're going to unload the ammunition and troops first. And then you're going to unload uh, fuel that you might have. And then the last thing that comes off there is food. Well, anyway, uh, they were unloading the ships, and we had just hit that island there. And all at once, the sirens on the ships went off. And uh, good God, here the Japs came. Like I said, at that time, the Air Force was pretty well intact. Here the Japs came flying overhead, strafing, dropping bombs uh, left and right, and the ships were firing away in the harbor, trying to knock the planes down. 
I don't know where our fighters were. Uh, but anyway, I remember trying to hit it. They always told us that if the bombs, if you in a place where you can't find anything for cover, we'll find a depression, a low spot on the ground. Well, I find a low spot, look looked like it might have been a creek bed at one time, and I hit that thing head first, got in there, because here they came strafing over the top, and no <laughs> sooner did I get in there, another guy lands flat on top of me. <laughs> that's but anyway, that's the way it was. Uh, the Japs had control of that island, and they knew they did. They could fly over it from Rabaul, with their bombers and uh, drop the bombs or eggs, whatever they wanted, and strafe. And that's why we had the foxholes on Guadalcanal. If you heard that siren go off, you better hit your foxhole fast because it didn't take them long to get there. And could you tell me more about the naval battle that happened off of Guadalcanal? What did you actually see of the battles that would happen with the Navy? Oh, the, with the Navy? Well, let me tell you, this is on Guadalcanal. This is one of the worst battles of all. Uh, no sooner than uh, at night, which was so terrible, our fleet and their fleet engaged in combat. And that was terrible. I'll never forget that. We had moved inland. We'd, we had made the landing all right, but we had moved inland, had the foxholes ready. But uh, the Japs were moving in, and our ships were moving in together. And out in this harbor there is where all that heavy, heavy naval fire took place. I think this is the heaviest naval battle in World War II. It was terrible. We lost some of our large ships out there. And to make it worse, two of our ships fired on each other. And uh, from, then... From your point of view, could you see the ships firing? Yeah, you bet you could. What, what would it look like? Lord, that's terrible. When those, whenever the Japs would fire into our coconut grove that we were in, whoom, boy. They just knocked the top of those coconut trees out. Anyway, uh, I got to say this. When the battle was over with out there, the word came to our group where we were, hey, get on down to the beach, get on down to the beach, you need help down there. Good God, I got down there and I thought, what in the world is this? Oh, they had a long row of stretchers there with nothing but dead and wounded on it. Uh, and we had, a, some of our destroyers had fished their own men out of the water, and they were covered with nothing but just oil slicks. And the only thing you could see as white on them was the white of their eyes. And I remember I said, well, pick out those guys that you think are gonna live and take them back to the battalion aid station. But that was one of the most sickening sights I ever saw. I got the beach on one side, just a row, solid row of wounded. Some dead, some dying. It was a horrible, horrible sight. And uh, how did you treat them? Uh, how would what? How would you treat the the men, the sailors? How did you treat them? How did we treat them? Well, uh, if you had bandage. You gave me, if they're hurting, give me a shot of morphine or two shots. And each one of us corpsmen carried a lot of morphine. That morphine was a godsend of blessing. And that, uh, it stopped a lot of that pain. But I don't know, there were dead Japs out there, but in the water, they let the Japs die out there in the water. But our own people that were wounded or they're floating out there in their life jackets. Pulled them up on the beach and gave them what first aid we could. That morphine was a blessing. And they, if they were had wounds, well, you treat them with what you have. 
which at that time was a little bit of salve, sulfur drugs. But morphine was a big, and the best thing you can do when you see guys near the point of death like that is to uh, just reassure them. I can remember taking care of this one guy, and we were going in Suicide Creek here. That's when we had to make a retreat. I told you about that earlier. We retreated back, and uh, this one guy was left out in front of the line. They said, hey, there's a guy down there, he's hit. Yeah, he got caught in machine gun fire in several places. And uh, he was bleeding. I tried to patch his wounds with cotton bandages and uh, give him morphine. And, uh, but he was hurting so after, even after I gave him the morphine, he said, Doc, just shoot me. Well, I wasn't going to do that. I says, we're going to get you back behind the line, and uh, they're going to take care of you back there. And later I heard, I checked on this guy. I said, you know what? He did get well. I thought that was something very remarkable. Huh? But I remember that so well. Oh, he had with machine guns plugged him in different places. And uh, that's that Suicide Creek was not a, uh, I don't know, the Japs were on the other side of the creek, but they had the fortified position underneath the trees, in the treetops. And the old word came, yeah, move forward. And then I don't know who get what uh, company commander it was, said, we can't move forward. All we're doing is getting killed, more men killed. I don't know which captain that was, or was it a colonel? All day. Says, we're going to retreat. And, uh, yeah, I guess that was all day. Says, we're going to retreat. And that's the only time that I can remember the company that I was with retreated. Oh. Just hang on one second. But uh, no, no, I, mean, I just told you the highlights of some of the work. He's going to ask you a few more questions, yeah, Daddy, okay. before this interview's over. So we have, um, probably in about 30 minutes, we have a lady that comes by and gives him a shower. Okay. Every yeah, day. well, that's all right. So just wanted you to... Yeah, you go ahead, that. ask some more. If there's anything you need to share, let me know. But uh, I was going to say... You were in K-3-5. Yeah. Do, do you remember a man named R.V. Bergen? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you bet I did. He was a correspondence writer or something. Yeah, I knew that old boy. He was pretty heavy set. He was a good guy. He wrote an article for the Saturday Evening Post, I think. I, I think, I, I think I, we might be getting the names confused. R.V. Bergen... Is uh, he was a officer in your company? I think he. Well, he might have been an officer. I thought he was are, are some high-ranking sergeant. Are you thinking of Ernie Pyle? He what? Are, are you thinking of Ernie Pyle? No, no. He was a writer for the Marine Corps. I know who you mean. Could Could you say the name? The reason I bring it up is because there's this man in Lancaster. Yeah. He was a good writer, too. Dad, you were in contact with R.V. Bergen, who wrote that. Uh, oh, yeah. Island yeah, I knew him. I knew yeah, him. He came to, yeah. Yeah. I know exactly who you're talking about. Oh, okay. I, I, I interviewed him a couple years ago, and so I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, you I know exactly who you're talking did, about. Did they ever get a hangout? Or? Yeah. He on the phone, and he passed away very recently. Yeah. Within the last few he months. was a great guy. Yeah. He could tell it like it was. <laughs> he was a good writer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. some of the, yeah, uh, yeah, that's just woeful. That's very but, close. But yet they, uh, same company, Bergen was on Cape Gloucester, wasn't on Guadalcanal, but I thought maybe they may have met. <laughs> but, but, 
there were a lot of famous people from your company. Eugene Sledge. Oh, yeah. You know, he was yeah. in your company, but after you had already well, been there. There were a lot of good guys there, but they were a lot of good guys killed. And I can still remember some of them quite well. Do you yeah. remember the names of any of the men who were killed from your company? Pardon? I... <clears throat> Do you remember the names of anyone who was killed from your company? Yeah, well, their nicknames. Uh, we had a big old Swede to call him the Dutchman. I, forgot, I don't remember his name. We just called him, hey, Dutch. <laughs> big old, he was a strong guy, and he got killed. Mm. He's a good guy. No, they were, I tell you, we had some captains who were Jewish uh, and officers who were Jewish and they were good. They were always looking for a combat medal of some type. They wanted to show how good they were. <laughs> yeah, they were pretty good. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just looking at my, uh, I'm just looking at my notes. Okay, here. Um, could you please tell me about your experiences with malaria when you were overseas? Oh, God. Well, if you get 104 fever, you get to feeling pretty bad. Uh, but I had my worst attack when I got home on leave, the only leave I ever got. But it went up to about 105, 106, whatever it was. And I went completely out of my head. I didn't know what was happening. And uh, they rushed me to the hospital at uh, Randolph Field, Texas. <laughs> I was just sweating, perspiring. I didn't know whether I was going to make it or not. And when I came to, I looked around that bed I was on. And my God, there was an old doctor in there that had experienced some of these malaria cases before that when they got, when they passed out of the head. And uh, there's a whole nest full of nurses around me in their white uniforms, and the doctor was trying to explain to them what was happening to me because I would just shake, I would make the whole bed shake. And uh, I felt like I was burning up, but actually I was cold. And uh, I really didn't, but boy, they were stuffing the quinine down me. Really a lot of quinine to kill off that malaria parasite that was in me. But if I hadn't gotten to Randolph Field in time, I'm sure I would have died. Because it started developing when I was home on leave and the folks lived only nine miles from Randolph Field. And I told him, I says, get me to Randolph Field to the hospital. He says, I'm, my fever's going too high. And uh, when it does get to 105, 106, you pass out. And the other thing is, your urine turns kind of dark because uh, you're killing off so many red blood cells. But malaria will kill you, that's for sure. What was the reason you got malaria if you took Adabrin when you were overseas? Well, yeah, that's a good question. The reason you got it, your body was in such a rundown condition that it just couldn't fight all that stuff anymore. Yeah. Yeah, we had some guys die with yellow fever. Their urine would turn dark which was meant that their red cells were dying off and they were passing them out. And uh, that was bad. Well, malaria today, I just read it in a magazine uh, from a church. Malaria today kills about 450,000 people a year. That's over in some parts of the world, not in the United States. Is most of that's over there in Asia or Africa. It's a... and, and if you don't mind me asking, sir, going back uh, to Guadalcanal, 
Can you talk to me about the living conditions, just how hot it was on Guadalcanal and what you all would do for water? <laughs> I know. Oh, man, that, you want to hear about that jungle juice? <laughs> oh, those Marines are crazy. <laughs> Some of them, they knew how to concoct uh, jungle juice. <laughs> That's what they call it. They'd have these five-gallon containers. <laughs> and uh, if they could get a little bit of oh, what is from the alcohol, we didn't give it to them. We weren't supposed to give them it from the sick bay. But anyway, they would go to the gallery, to the kitchen, and they would find some kind of dough or whatever it was and uh, put a little bit of, oh, sugar. That's what it was, sugar, yeah. Put sugar in one of those five-gallon containers and uh, put the jungle juice, the coconut oil in there, and by golly, it, it got strong, real strong. <laughs> oh, those ju In fact, let me tell you, I had some money, uh, I had some Aussie money still in my purse, uh, and... Uh, uh, yeah, or somewhere, maybe it's uh, my own car. And uh, they'd charge so much for a shot of that stuff. <laughs> and it, it could knock you out. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 All it took was, or better still, what they would do is just crack a coconut open and put a, or drill a hole in it, put sugar in it, let it stand for a while, and boy, it would be strong, strong. <laughs> but they had to get the sugar first from the cooks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've never heard that before. So that's how they would make alcohol overseas? Yeah, made alcohol, sure. It fermented. <laughs> what I was talking about was a lot of the Guadalcanal veterans who I've met, they talk about just, they, they talk about heat exhaustion and how hot it gets on Guadalcanal, and they would get, you would have to get water from the dirty rivers where the Japanese would be, and then you would have to put tablets in your water? Well, I'd I put drops of iodine in there. You know what? We carried quite a few little bitty containers of iodine. If we couldn't get water, if they didn't deliver it, we had a creek bottom that we knew had dead bodies floating in it, well, you put a couple of drops of iodine in your canteen, and that'd kill off a bacteria. But, I mean, you guys were so thirsty, yeah. that's the water you would yeah, drink. Yeah, I had some of those things, yeah. I had several of them in my core pot. See, I mean, <laughs> living in today's world, you can't complain about anything, you know? <laughs> and, and, and the bodies that you're talking about, those are Japanese bodies, right? Yeah. That's a Japanese. I don't know what they did. I, uh, so, do you remember when you were on Guadalcanal, were there any serious firefights that you remember getting into where you had to act as a corpsman on Guadalcanal? Or was most of your, uh, you know, life-saving done on Cape Gloucester? Do you remember anything about, uh, besides the wounded sailors, on uh, Guadalcanal, were there other men who you treated? How did they treat us on Guadalcanal? Would you, you say that for me, please? If you could just ask him if there were any... Okay, Daddy, were there any uh, battles that you were part of on Guadalcanal where you had to end up treating people on Guadalcanal? Were there actual battles that you got involved in on Guadalcanal. Wait, run that by again. Okay, were there actual battles on Guadalcanal that you uh, had to end up acting as a medic I don't on know. Guadalcanal? When you were on Guadalcanal, yeah. did you have to act as a medic there? Were there battles you were part of there? I'm not understanding that Don't, question. Okay. Don't worry. Okay, we'll go. Yeah, we'll go to another one. He does have a story about a Green Bay Packer. 
Would you like him to tell that? Sure, I'll just that now. Dad, um, do you want to tell him the story about the professional football player, the Green Bay Packer? Oh, yeah, he got wounded. He got, oh. he is out in front. Do me a favor. When you say that story... Um, yeah, yeah. No, 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 just pretend I've never heard it before. Yeah. Well... Andrew Chiswick was one of the best company captains we ever had. And he used to be a football player for the, uh, the Green Bay Packers. And uh, he got wounded out in the field. He was heavy. He's over 200 pounds. I'll never forget that. And the word got out, hey, the captain's hit out there. He needs help. Well... I said, all right, you guys keep us covered from the back, and we'll go out there and take care of him, get him back behind the lines, uh, behind the line of fire anyway. Well, I don't know whether two of us or four of us, it might have been just two of us, along with our combat stuff and our uh, core pot, core, core pit, uh, what I call a, your first aid kit. Uh, yeah, first aid kit. Yeah, uh, we got out there, and uh, he was hit. He was hit in the head, and uh, he couldn't walk. Couldn't. But we finally, yeah, I remember bandaging that a little bit. He got hit in the head, and uh, we just had to get him out of him. Took him to the back, and from there they. I don't know what happened, but he was heavy, heavy. I did run into him later on the streets of San Diego, and he had a nurse by his side, and he was walking. Hey, isn't that something? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's yeah. Yeah, he was walking. Oh, Andrew Chiswick, he was a great guy. But Captain that? Haldane... I don't know, he was just something else. There's a book coming out on him. Oh, is there? Uh, on uh, uh, Andrew, Ch not Andrew Chiswick. Haldane. Uh, Haldane. Has he seen the Pacific? Uh, Only a few of us. Seen him on the watch? Yeah, it's a little too, too much, brings back too many. Yeah, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. But I was going to say, that's about, you know, the, the Cape Gloucester episode is about yes. his company. That's, yes, it is. That's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. But, uh, sir, all we have to do, I just have a few more questions about uh, Cape sure. Gloucester, and then we'll be all done. Sure. Was there any other stories that you wanted to, thank you for telling me about that one. So, I've never been... Um, Could you please describe the conditions on Cape Gloucester? You know, the mud and the rain. What was Cape Gloucester like? What was that, Sarah? The weather conditions on Cape Gloucester. The weather? Yeah, the weather conditions. A little bit more about rain and mud. Oh, God. Let's see. It was out New Britain. Boy, the rain was heavy, heavy. I mean, when you get caught in the monsoon rains, everything floods. Uh, the vehicles can't move on the roads or along the beach, and you just sink down in the mud. You're, you're walking with shoes halfway full of water and mud, and you wait until you can get down to the beach and wash out, take your shoes off, and kind of rinse the water off of the socks and then put them back on. Yeah, that was real important, trying to keep your uh, feet halfway dry. But that didn't always work. You still got blisters from uh, all that mess, that, the mud and wet feet all the time. Whoa. Got jungle rot. <laughs> what would you do at night when it's just pouring down rain? How do you sleep when you're outside? Uh, good question. You got wet. <laughs> <laughs> now, sometimes you just got wet at monsoon rain. Well, we we did have ponchos that we could get 
and uh, try to get under them. Just let the rain come down. Uh, and that monsoon rain to something else. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, sometimes you just didn't stay dry for any length of time. That's in the monsoon rains. So there's one story that you have where uh, the scouts, you, this is at Cape Gloucester, I believe it was at a place called Aurori. Um, a place called what? Aurori Ridge. Uh, but, but basically the story, to, to my understanding, is that there were some scouts who had been wounded and you ran up uh, to help them and you were taking on uh, Japanese fire and there was a Japanese sniper in a tree. And yeah. You, you had a carbine. Oh, and, God. And, and you got so excited, you went to shoot yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. And, and you dropped him. That allows the rascals up in a tree. He tied himself up in a tree. So if you wouldn't mind, could you tell me that story from the beginning, please? Yeah. Well, now the word went out, they need a corpsman down and got a guy hit. Yeah. I went down there. He's hit, sure enough. I got hit several times, but he was still alive, and I gave him first aid as much as I could try to, and suddenly that rascal started shooting at me from up in the tree. Who? And it went right through here. You see it kicking up the dirt, and I thought, like, hey, this might be it. And finally, I called to the guys behind me. Uh, I was out in front of the front, and I, Told him, I said, hey, he's up in that tree there. I hit him. <laughs> and boy, they peppered that tree with machine gun fire and everything else. It wasn't but a minute it was over with. <laughs> no more. <laughs> they just really sprayed that tree when they found out he was up in that tree. And, and who, who was it? A Japanese? Yeah. A Jap. He was tied up there. Oh, Yeah. Sometimes they weren't tied up too good and then they'd fall to the ground. But <laughs> I hated those snipers. I hated them. The, what I wanted to ask you about is, in, in the version that I heard, before you asked the Marines to knock out the Japanese sniper, you had a car. Oh, yeah, I had a rifle too with me then. I, See, a corpsman carried either a rifle or a pistol. Either one. Anyway, I had my rifle with me because I was on the front with the Marines. And I saw him up there in that tree, and I tried to load my rifle real fast, if I saw it. And daggum, I got so excited, I emptied that rifle on him up there in the tree. But something happened, and I was out of ammunition. Uh, I, I think you would try to take the safety off, but you dropped the clip. Yeah, you that's it. what it was, yeah. <laughs> that is right. Instead of releasing the safety, I released a clip, and my shells fell to the ground. <laughs> and boy, I let those guys behind me say, hey, up there, he's up there. He's <laughs> but, but, but was that common for all the corpsmen to carry weapons with them? No, yeah, yeah, they could carry a rifle or a pistol. I would, uh, well, a pistol's all right for close range, I guess, but uh, I wanted something a little more powerful. And yeah, you know, when you're on the very front, you have these machine guns like uh, the night they're so terrible, cross-firing. You know, if you fire straight ahead, you don't hit much. But if you shoot down the line, you're going to hit more. That's uh, really important to do it that way. And then, of course, you got your mortar behind you. Uh, you got your uh, all kinds of weapons behind the front line. Behind. But the front line is where... You have the riflemen, the infantrymen, to take the brunt of it. If they hadn't, there wouldn't have been much left to those guys behind us. But they're 
That one night, and it was so bad, they were determined to knock out that 37 millimeter field piece, and I was right next to it. They wanted to knock that thing out and then go through that hole in the line and spread out behind us, but they never got there. When you were in combat, how close would you say the Japanese soldiers got to you? During, got to me? During a fire? Ha! Those critters, maybe five yards <laughs> or ten, something like that. They, were, they weren't that far away. They weren't that far away. Of course, they were crazy anyway. They were hopped up hollering, Banzai, Banzai, kill you, SOB. They could cuss like I don't know what. Uh, they, I don't know, they were just, I think most of those Japs, when they were up there in the very front, I think they were just hopped up on drugs. And, and, and you mentioned, you know, at, this was at Suicide Creek, right? Yeah. So the Japanese would have a bonsai charge at Suicide Creek? And Suicide Creek. The Japanese were dug under those great big trees they had in the jungle. Those trees would go up 100 feet in the air. Huge tree, huge road system. But they were dug underneath the trunk of that, uh, yeah, that tree, like a bunch of rats. They were pretty well protected there because you couldn't get them out of there with a bombing. You couldn't get them out of there with Stracing, you just had to wait till they came out. Or, better still, if if you had it available, uh, burn them out of there. But uh, we never had that stuff available. The torch is a hot flame. The flamethrower. Uh, yeah, flamethrowers. But that night, you know, so... It, can, can you explain, you all had taken the Japanese position in the day, and then they counterattacked at night? Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you explain? Sure. So how did you get the, that ridge? How did you capture that ridge in the first place? Before the Japanese counterattacked, how did you capture that area? How did we protect our area? How did you capture the area? So the Japanese soldiers, they counterattacked that night? Well, uh, we had been chasing them. We knew where they were going. Yeah, they wanted to counterattack. You bet they did. We chased them out of those foxholes with that 37 millimeter. We were blasting the foliage off the trees and everything, really firing those little cannonballs in there. And... Uh, then behind us, our platoons. In other words, uh, that fighting was more or less conjugated in one small area. And that's when we just let all hell break loose with fire, with uh, mortar, machine gun fire, and uh, hand grenades. Yeah, I think I threw one or two, too. And I got to tell you about that. You know, they always told us, said, look out for those, uh, said, use those hand grenades. If you hear some Jap getting close to you and he's acting like an animal wanting you to fire on him, says, just pull a pin on a hand grenade and throw it over there right in his direction. Uh, use those hand grenades too, because they would try to get close to you, making odd noises like animals or saying something to draw your attention so that you do fire. You didn't fire unless you really thought there was something moving out there. Uh, the Japs used all kind of tricky ways to uh, get to us. In the foxholes, yeah, if they could do it. But boy, the Marines, they just held their fire until they knew they could almost see the white of their eyes and then, punk, let them have it. But the Japs were too crazy, waving at that gun. Hey, Banzai, thinking just sheer numbers, and they hopped up. That's you no. Know, in other words, I thought suicide was a thing. 
the the reason they wanted you all to fire oh yeah was to show where your positions were that's right? exactly right to give away your position but uh, the uh, officer says hey everybody had hand grenades on their belt and if you heard some noise over there and they and uh, you couldn't make it well you'd know whether or not it's the japs cussing or what it was doing. Just pull a pin on a hand grenade and throw it over there. That usually quiets them down. Yeah. They don't like that hand, those hand grenades are pretty handy. And you mentioned you threw a couple of them as well? Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't hard to do to pull a pin, pull a pin in. Out there. The, there was an incident during that uh, and, and so you all knew that the Japanese would counterattack that night. Oh yeah, we knew it, and we—that's why we had everything up that you could imagine centered down that one spot, and that's what the Japanese wanted to knock out and fan behind us and go back to the people in the rear and attack them, but they never got back there. Like I say. Dead bodies all over out there. They didn't care. The there was an incident where there was some friendly fire. Well, what? You, you had an incident where one of the American rounds was short. There was a short round that almost killed you. You almost got killed by some friendly fire one time. Oh, Did Lord, yes. I tell you, I wasn't there. that big a fool to stand up like a jet. No, mm -hmm. I hugged that deer ground. Mm -hmm. I hugged it wherever I could. And uh, it's harder to kill a guy on the ground. What uh, It's easy to knock him off for standing up running mm -hmm. towards you. Just... And machine gun, or the B.A.R. men, they were good at picking them off. Like this one guy said, <laughs> he's a pretty good old sergeant. That was just like shooting rats coming out of a hole. Said so they just kept coming. <laughs> did you, one time, Daddy, did you almost get killed by some American fire? Well, that's that station? time. I was going up there, crawling on my hands and knees there, hollering, Corman, Corman, sure our own men would get hit too. And uh, they, uh, and uh, I could hear them and I knew where they were out there. There, four or five of them hollering at the same time. Corman, Corman, yeah, yeah, get up here. Uh, and I just was crawling on my hands and knees, and uh, I had to call out the password, Filipino, so they wouldn't shoot me. Like a guy said, hey, Doc, we had you in our sights. Good thing you called Filipino. We were ready to blast you out. But, you know, but that brings up, you know, it was very dark that night, right? It was... Uh, how are you, how, are, how do you even see what you're doing when it's so dark at night? You just had to go by sound. It's so dark. If you'd hear him squeaking over there, or Corman, they could answer, Corman, yeah. Yeah, oh boy. Yeah, and you'd bandage, you'd give him some more feet, or bandage him up, stop the bleeding. And, uh, but... But that was the most horrible night of all during the war for me. After I get him to say that one story, uh, one other question will be done. Okay. The, sir, there, there was one incident where you were by the 37 millimeter uh, gun, the cannon, and an American round landed right next to you. It hit the man next to you, but it, it, it threw up dirt and it hit you and you had to patch up that man? Does, does that ring a bell? Let's see, Cheryl, just okay. let's see. You were standing at one point by the 37 cannon, cannon and um, it... An American shell. An American shell came over and it actually hit the man next to you and kicked up some dirt onto you. 
and then you patched up that man that was next to you. He was hitting the stump. He was hitting the stump. Do you remember that incident? Run that one by okay, again, so Cheryl. you were standing by the 37 uh, cannon. cannon. Yeah. And a round came in and actually hit a man in the stomach next to you and kicked dirt up on you. And you had to end up treating that man who had been hit in the stomach. Do you recall that incident? Does that one sound familiar? No, I don't. It's in the tape, uh, he literally says... Yeah. There was the so much happening. Uh, I, I At like uh, one time, that, there was so much happening so fast. Because like, battles don't last long. It doesn't take but maybe an hour or two and it's over with. But the damage has been done. And... Uh, yeah, you're going to have some stragglers going around that don't know what they're doing. Uh, but, uh, yeah. There was this one incident, though. You were by a 37, you were by the gun, you know, the 37. That big gun, mortar, yeah, yeah. And an American mortar, a mortar shell came, yeah. and it landed right next to you, and it hit the guy next to you. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, slightly, yeah, slightly, yeah. Yeah, that, there was that gun they were after to knock out. And, uh, yeah, I, I remember that s slightly. The, 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 re the reason why I bring it up is because that man, he was wounded very seriously in the stomach, yeah. but you patched him up and you were talking about in... You know, um, you were talking about the difficulty of patching him up at night. Yeah. But it, it, don't worry about it if, if you don't remember that right now. No, I... I, uh, I guarantee the moment I walk out that door, he's going to tell you that story very clearly. But uh, don't worry about it right now, sir. Um, yeah. If you could just give me an idea, though. You had mentioned earlier, maybe that's what he had mentioned. You mentioned that there was a man during this battle um, who died in your arms. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. Very, very well, you bet. Could you give a little background on what happened? All I know is he was hit and he was not too far from me and I wanted to give him first aid and I tried to... But it's so pitch dark, all I could feel was blood running out and warm guts. And uh, that, that was it. He died there. Yeah. So, but for the typical Marine who you had to patch up, what was your routine? You know, what, when you would come to the side of a wounded man, a wounded Marine, what was the first things that you would do? Well, if he was really hurting bad, I would give him morphine to keep him from going into complete shock. Uh, going into complete shock can kill him, too. And then uh, in the dark, if you can find it, bandage it. Stop the bleeding. Put a bandage on it. Every man carried a, a bandage in his belt. Take it and use it rapid. Yeah, stop the bleeding whenever you can. But most bleeding will stop after a certain length of time from a billet wound, period. If it's not in a vital organ in the inside. But if it's a flesh wound, it doesn't take too much to stop that. And, and, and after you bandage up the wound, is there anything else you can do? Yeah, sometimes that's all you can do is wrap a bandage around it, stop it from bleeding, because it will coagulate the blood itself. But wrap it around to stop the bleeding so he doesn't die from losing too much blood. Do you remember any type of disinfectant that you would put on the wound, like sulfur uh, melanide? Uh, no, not, not in the dark. As I said, you can always treat an infection later then. 
Yeah. They can do that behind the back. For you. Your job is to give them first aid, stop the bleeding. And one thing that I found out helped, just like that guy that wanted me to shoot him, some guys, they just ready to give up, call it quits. But if you tell them, we're going to get you out of here, and you're going back behind the line, you know, that does more to help them than anything. It gives them hope. Gives them hope. That's the thing. Yeah, I remember several like that. Just give them some hope. To know that uh, uh, help is available. Would, would you tell them that no matter what wound they had, or would you only say that to the ones who you were confident would get yeah. better? Yeah. I was pretty confident about what I told them. I was an extreme optimist. Uh, no, need, no need to tell them you're going to die. I got to tell you this, it's kind of funny. When I had my heart attack there in Kerrville, and they take me to the hospital in San Antonio, VA there from Kerrville, I was in the back of the ambulance, and they had this young lady back there with me. I don't know if she knew anything or not. And I asked her, well, what, are you, uh, what are my vital signs? She said, oh, your pulse is getting low, or your face is getting white. <laughs> she painted the darkest picture she could. And I thought, well, she doesn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, words of encouragement can mean more. But what you got to do, if they're really hurting, give them morphine. I carried a lot of morphine threats in, uh, well, it was in my core, ki core pit, and kit, yeah. Where, where would you uh, stick the morphine? Anywhere I could stick it in them. <laughs> so it doesn't have to go in a vein or anything? No, no, you don't have to. That morphine takes effect wherever you put it. Yeah, oh yeah, nurse will, yeah, back in the hospital, they'll stick you in the arm and put alcohol. Uh, that doesn't apply out in the jungle. <laughs> yeah. and, and you had mentioned also that there was a, an incident where you patched up a man whose leg, you know, it, it, his leg has been blown off. I mean, what can you do as a foreman to actually well, they can. That? You can put a tight bandage around it, real, real tight to stop some of it, yeah. Like a tourniquet? Yeah, tourniquet. Yeah, something like a tourniquet, really. Put it on there tight. And and did you have anything to do after you would patch up the men? Did you carry them back on a stretcher to the first aid station, or who did No. Uh, and the firing died down, and you call for help. Say, hey, there's a guy lying over there, and he's, you got to get him back to the first aid station, or, yeah, to the battalion aid station. Yeah, sometimes one you got to call upon them to help each other sometimes, and that's important. Yeah. But did you, uh, you you being a, a medic, you know, you being a corpsman, did you wear any insignia to the to prove to the uh, job? Good question. <laughs> that at first they told us back in the states here. Now, you're going to be a first aid man. You put that bandage on the run with a cross on it. <laughs> I thought to myself, hey, these people don't know what they're talking about. That's just a target. <laughs> I sent word back to headquarters. I said, tell those guys not to wear that bandage out there. That's just a target for them. <laughs> I never did see any more guys wearing a bandage back there. Not a first aid bandage. Now, you know, they wanted to knock out the corpsmen as fast as they could because they knew they were the ones that were helping them get well. No, I, that was a bunch of humbug wearing that bandage around your arm. And you didn't wear it on the helmet either? Uh, no, didn't wear any there either. Just, no cross up there and all. So the Japanese would purposely try to knock out the uh, Oh, yeah, if they could see that red cross, that was a target. 
That, uh, that's not very nice. Yeah, that's, yeah, I sent word back. I said, tell those corn to stop wearing that red cross. Yeah. It was around their arm, you know. Yeah. That didn't help one bit. Now, Mr. Billnitzer. Yeah. What advice do you want to give to future generations? What advice do I give to future generations? Well, think of what a great country we have. It's tremendous. Best country on the face of the earth. And you are enjoying the fruits of what others fought for to give you this country. Remember, there are a lot of people that would like very, very much to take over this country from within or without. And you make the best citizen you know how to make. Be a good, honest citizen and a good Christian man. And uh, it, uh, you need to be thankful for what we have and that the country is worth fighting for when it comes to the worst. That's the advice I'd give them. What would you want to say to all the men, you know, who were killed in the war? If you could say something to them, what would you want them to know? No, wait, wait, wait. What would you say to the men who sacrificed their lives for this country, Daddy? If they could hear you talking at this point, what would you say to the men who sacrificed their lives? Well, what would I say to a man that's ready to die? That has sacrificed his life for his country. If you were standing there at the grave, and talking to one of these soldiers, what would you say to one who actually gave, paid the ultimate price? Well, what could I say to the mourners? In other words, uh, I could say, well, he's a great man, he served his country well, and may the Lord have mercy on his soul. He's at home in paradise. And uh, he made a great sacrifice for this country. We we'll all have to die someday. And, and, and what kind of person, Mr. Bilnitzer, um, what kind of person do you always want your friends and your family to think of you as? Can I share what is that? And what kind of person do you want to be remembered as, Daddy, by your family and your friends? What would you well, like for people to I, say? I feel that I spent most of my life working with young people in the schools. I spent 36 years in the public schools, and I'd like for them to be good Christian boys and girls and uh, study the Word of God, the Ten Commandments, and try to live by them. And what would you like for people to say about you, Daddy? About me. About you. When, mm -hmm. people, when, when your friends and your family, when they think of you, what kind of person do you want them to think of you as? Well, I would say... He did a good job of serving his country and is a Christian man and is happy to go home and meet the Lord. Not yet. Uh, well, <laughs> my time could come any time. No, don't say that. At 99. <laughs> I, I interviewed someone uh, uh, that's 111. Oh. I interviewed an 111 year old, so, so you're just a kid. Yeah. Was he the man in Austin? Hmm. He interviewed that man in Austin who sat on his front porch. Smoking cigars yes. and drinking whiskey. Yes. Oh, that must have been interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think. He, 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 uh, the thing is, because it was segregated back then, so yes. he didn't see action. He didn't see action. I mean, it was cool because he's this older oh. man, but, you know, his stories, you know, definitely outbeat oh, his. Oh, he's, he's got them. But, uh, yeah. Mr. Donitzer, 
one thing we just needed to cover. Um, could you just mention how you actually heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor? What were you doing? Because it's my understanding you were my age. I'm 21, and I think you were 21 when the war started. And so, how did you actually hear about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Uh, Sarah, can you explain that? How, how did you first hear about the attack on Pearl Harbor, and what were you doing? Uh-huh. Uh, re uh, uh, repeat that. How you first heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor, and it has something to do with report cards. Oh, <laughs> I was sitting at home by the... By the uh, uh, making out report cards, uh, and uh, I was at my mother and father's house. I was teaching in this little uh, Mexican school, and the word came over the radio that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. And I thought, well, that's horrible. And uh, I thought, well, I'm 21. I'm going to have to serve my country because I knew they would take young men like myself. I was exactly 21 and I was in good physical shape and I was ready to serve because I didn't want them to tear up the country and our homeland, our wonderful country that we have. Everyone thought that the Japanese would have never attacked it because they were talking peace, 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 and then boom, boom, boom. And uh, there just comes a time when you got to defend your country and the beliefs that you have as a Christian person. But, but you were 21 years old and you were already a school teacher? Yeah. Had you just become a school teacher? Or well, how, how I did that work? I'd had two years of college, and at that time, you didn't have to have four years. You could teach if you had two years. And uh, I enjoyed my 40 years of being with the public schools. Wow. It was great. Your whole life has been about helping others. Right. Right. I enjoy my... After I retired, I made 110 trips to the Mexican border taking food and medical supplies and other things from the church to the Mexican border, helping the poor people down there at Eagle Pass. And that was one of my greatest blessings, I think, that I could render. At my expense, I made those trips. What uh, motivated you to do it? How old then? Uh -huh. What motivated you to do it? Why did you want to do that, Daddy? Well, the people down there needed help. They needed uh, a lot of things that the people in this country didn't want anymore, and I knew it could help the poor people along the border, not only on this side, but also on the other side. I took it to a mission station down there. I'm sure that really helped them out. I'm sure yeah, it was appreciated. 110 trips in my van. I paid for the gas and everything myself. That, 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 that you're, you're a good man. Um, it, was there anything else you wanted to get on the table while we have it? I mean, he did really well. Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah, I, I think this has really covered it well. Yeah. I, I feel I, very satisfied. I appreciate you letting me go over the 45-minute thing. It's, oh, sure. It's, it's good that we have it on camera now. I, I told um, the lady to just... Wait. <laughs> oh no, I'm she. I'm, uh, it will take me five minutes to pack up. The the only thing. Uh, okay. My father was a a Lutheran pastor, having immigrated from uh, Hungary, and uh, he wanted to come over here and be a missionary and convert the Indians and the bad boys over here. And he served about forty years in the churches. And when World War II came along, people 
kind of looked down their noses on the Germans and the Hungarians because they didn't care too much for them. And uh, one day near the end of the war, and I got to tell you this because we don't have any need for bigotry in this country. Uh, this man came by the house by my dad's church at Marion, Texas. I said, Reverend, we understand you're still preaching in German language sometimes. He says, yes, that's true. That's because some of these older pioneer members of the congregation who founded the church understand German better than English. And he looked right at my dad, and he was really dragging him through the fire, you might say, saying, well, Pastor, this is America. Don't you know you're supposed to abide by the laws of this land here and speak English and this and that? I says, here you are preaching in German, and I wondered whether or not he was even loyal to this country. And he, he was really giving my father heck. In fact, my father had been uh, attacked once before by this fanatical group. And uh, my father looked at him and punched right at his heart and said, I have four sons in the military right now. How many do you have? That guy turned around, went the other way, and I guess he's still running. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. There's no need for all this bigotry and hatred in this country because you're of a certain nationality, be it Hungarian, be it Russian. If they're in this country and want to be good citizens, take them in as a brother and sister in Christ. Uh, I don't care whether they're black, brown, or white. I've taught in all Mexican schools, and I enjoyed it, those little kids. And, and coaching... I had black boys on there, I had brown boys, and I had white boys. But and uh, They're all boys. Uh, that's right. I, I can't see this bigotry and hatred that still exists in this country. We're all God's children. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mr. Bill Nitzer? Yeah. When you were talking to me about Guadalcanal, and the naval bombardment from the Japanese, did you treat any of the men who were wounded by the big Navy shells? I was wounded by going into Nagasaki for occupational duty right after the war, after the bomb had been dropped. The radiation was bad in Nagasaki, it was heavy. And when we went in there to occupy Japan, because Truman told them if they didn't stop mistreating our troops, we would drop another bomb. Well, I was in a, an occupation duty with the first group in Nagasaki, and it was still very radioactive. And I have what you call uh, ionization radiation. That's like giving an overdose of radiation. But I managed to take fairly good care of myself of being treated first one thing after another. And glory to the man on high, I'm going to be 99 this month. That's awesome. How but, about that? But, but the, I, I, should, I just wanted to know, though, um, on Guadalcanal, you know, the Japanese naval ships, they would shell you on oh. Guadalcanal. Some of the veterans who I've interviewed, they talk about they were buried alive. Not buried alive, but, the you know, like you said, the Navy shells would blast the coconut trees. Yeah. From where you were, could you actually see the Japanese ships shelling you? Or you couldn't see we the ships? We did it first until we hit the... Uh, dugouts that we were in. Yeah, we had to hit the dugouts we were in. And the dugouts were like this. If this finger represented a coconut log, a tree, they were like this, above the dugout, uh, so that if something fall, it wouldn't kill us. But boy, these dugouts that we had to get into 
most of the time were filled with mud, water, and mosquitoes. But you still got in there. <laughs> just, just do me a favor. Just do a... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God bless you. Uh, yeah, we had to get in there. <laughs>